In this video, we're looking closely at the differences between flexural deformation and shear deformation of a shear wall. And most importantly, looking at why which one controls over the other and what influences that. Let's get into it. As you've seen before, if you've gotten been in other videos, we have a shear wall under load P deforming in some way um, and displacing some amount delta as you see. That shear wall's dimensions are based on its height and its length. Those are the two primary dimensions that kind of play into this whole behavioral differences between flexural mode and shear mode of deformation. Um, thickness is the third one that, that is really the, the main dimension that plays into it. So thickness, height, and length of shear walls. Now, walls when subject to in-plane lateral loads undergo a deflection. This deflection is a result of the wall behaving in either a flexural mode or a shear mode. The mode that dominates the overall displacement of the shear wall is dependent mostly on the height and length of the wall itself. Most shear walls do not displace under pure flexural deformation or pure shear deformation alone. Most of the time, it is a combination of the two. In structural engineering, we look to determine the rigidity of a wall or the stiffness of a wall like we've talked about before. The stiffness or rigidity can be thought about as the amount of force it takes to displace the wall a unit amount. And determining the rigidity of a wall is important because it serves two purposes. The first being determining distributions of forces to your vertical lateral elements. For flexible diaphragms, this is less critical because your forces are distributed based on tributary widths to individual vertical lateral elements. However, it can still apply when you have multiple lengths of shear wall of varying lengths within a line of a flexible diaphragm and determining how much load is distributed to each one of those individual shear walls. Um, so don't just think if you have flexible that you ignore what we're doing here. And then for rigid diaphragms, this is the key component because the, um, the rigidity of your vertical lateral elements, your shear walls, your brace frames, everything in between, um, ultimately determines how the forces from the diaphragm are distributed to each individual vertical lateral element. The stiffer the thing, the more force gets kind of sucked to it like a sponge. That's just kind of how the force of nature works. And number two, the obvious point why most of you have probably clicked on this video, determining how much a system displaces or drifts. We remember that our total displacement is the following equation. The first part of the equation is flexural deformation component, and the second half is shear deformation component. And for today's example, we are going to be doing masonry. The cross-sectional area is equal to the thickness T of our wall. L is the length of our wall that we see up here. I is your moment of inertia, which is equal to uh, the standard rectangular equation is BD cubed over 12. We substitute in thickness of wall as your B and then the length of your wall as your D for the equation. So TL cubed over 12. This assumes, this is important, an uncracked section. So we don't engage our rebar and we assume that our masonry has not cracked under load. That goes into a further topic that, again, uh, I explored a lot when I was studying for the SE, but for right now, we are just going to take that at face value, okay? But it means, uh, in short, that you get to use the full area of your wall in order to run these calculations. Once your section starts to crack, then things get a little mixy. So um, we're not going there today, um, but please do ask about that or look into that um, if you're out there on your own uh, working on a project. And then your modulus of elasticity of the material, which is our masonry, is equal to 0.4 E sub M, um, which that we talked about last time how, how that came to be. Um, but that gets into Poisson's ratio and blah, blah, blah. But if you want to know more in depth about how they came to this conclusion for masonry, for masonry, check out that previous video. All right, we're going to keep going. Let's now substitute these values in to the above equation and rewrite this. This can be rewritten a little further as follows. I know you're looking at this going, hey, Rich, I thought this channel was all about putting numbers in for the variables because variables uh, just you know, can get overly complex and I'm trying to learn this and you're not freaking doing a good freaking job and I feel like I'm back in school and my professor is talking a million things a second and it's just a bunch of letters and I thought I was an engineer and I thought numbers were my friend and it's, you know what? I know, I get it, I know. This is as far as we're gonna go with kind of mixing up and jum jumbling up the equation. Um, from here on out, it actually gets really simplistic. So, deep breath. 
Okay, let's go. One quick note, you might be saying, hey, why didn't you take into account the 0 0.4 E sub M? Well, it's because it's constant throughout for this problem because we're doing a comparison here. So we're not really finding values of displacement. Um, we are more doing a comparison of a wall itself. So we can kind of just omit the 0 0.4 E sub M because the modulus of elasticity is constant, okay? The amount of uh, displacement is gonna be contributed from both flexural deformation and shear deformation. But how much percentile is one over the other, we do not know. The percentile contribution is dependent on H over L of your shear wall. Think about it intuitively like this. If you have a very tall, skinny wall, and you have the power to stand, you know, way up here and be Mr. Strongman or woman and push on the top of that wall, it's going to be significantly easier to displace that wall than it is if you were to have, oh, I should get my big fat head out of the way, a short, and I'll, I'll really drive the point home here, stout wall. Trying to push on that is significant, you're going to require significantly more effort, AKA force, to move that short, long wall than you will to move that tall, slender wall. And what variables determine those wall geometries? Well, if thickness T is um, constant, which we are for this problem, then there's only two more variables. Your length, your height. Your length, your height. Flexural deformation looks something a little like this. It's gonna kind of stay planted at its base and is going to kind of bend, if you will, if you think about the wall as kind of a bendy putty material. That is flexural deformation dominated wall displacement. Ooh, that was a lot. Whereas shear displacement, we talked about having a stack of individual sheets of paper, pushing on them and them sliding across one another in our last video. You will get something more, I'm, I'm heavily exaggerating here, but you will get something more along the lines of this shape of, or mode of uh, deformation and ultimate displacement. And both of which have some amount of displaced wall right there, delta. And it's a combination of these two that create, uh, I'm gonna do a bad job here, but that create kind of a, you know, a hybrid of the two depending on the wall. With a couple more variables added, we have flexural displacement, shear displacement, add those together, gets you a total displacement of your wall. All right, let's do some use cases here and really solidify our understanding. We have our equation. Let's start off with a ratio H over L equal to 0 0.25. So if we picture that, this is our very short, long shear wall. And we can reduce this even further because as we said, modulus of elasticity is constant and our thickness of our wall is constant for this comparison. So if those were just equal to one and one, then this piece of the equation also becomes a constant and will go away. So let's get rid of it. Well, let's all use our calculators. Plug in 0 0.25 for your variable in the parentheses and keep both of these portions of the equation separate. Don't add them together yet. You will see that that gets you 0 0.06 and 0 0.75. Now, when we do add those together, that gets us a total of 0 0.81, this decimal is your displacement of your wall when all the other uh, pieces of the equation are stripped away. So this isn't inches or anything like that. This is a unitless expression because we're doing the comparison in a simplistic manner. But we can use ratios, because again, we talked about up here, what percentage contribution of each mode contributes to the overall effects and total displacement. And that's what we're getting at here. So we can use those ratio percentiles. Well, if you do 0 0.06 over the sum, 0 0.81, and same thing over here, 
that will get you your percent contributions, which you will see here, a flexural comp uh, contribution for the s little tiny uh, long wall is 7%, while the other shear deformation is 93% contribution. So you can see just how much one dominates over the other when you have an extreme case of um, wall geometry. Now, let's increase this H over L ratio all the way up to 3.0, and we'll just take some increments along the way, and uh, we'll, we'll compile that test data to see kind of how things perform, and we'll review. All right, see you in a second. We can see that as the um, ratio H over L increased, we uh, changed the percent of total displacement um, from shear dominated to flexure dominated. So as we continue to move down, you'll see our percentages change. And as we get to that kind of 1.0 to 1.5 ratio, our domination between shear to flexure actually swaps. And then from that point on, your flexural uh, deformation contribution is what controls the overall displacement of your shear ball. Some things to remember if you're new here. This table and this procedure today is not to calculate the displacement of your shear walls. It's just to show a comparison of your shear deformation versus your flexural deformation. If you were to be calculating your displacement, you would need your modulus of elasticity, E sub M, and your thickness of your wall. So uh, don't forget those, and don't mix up what we're doing here with that calculation. And today's example, I didn't mention it outright, but I think through all the figures, we understand this. This is for a cantilevered shear wall, um, but you could construct the same type of um, example with different systems, but you would just need to use a modified different equation for that type of system. So that's totally fine. But today, cantilevered shear walls. All right, team, the auditorium doors are open, you're free, but if you're still studying and wanna check out more structural engineering videos, check out my channel. Thank you to each and every one of you for liking, subscribing, and interacting the way that you have. I appreciate it, and I'll catch you next time. Peace.